Hey guys, welcome to the video. You're probably here because you read the title and this is a video about the new Fat Shark goggle, the HDO2. So, what is special about the HDO2 and, you know, why would you buy it? Well, I can just tell you right now that I've been flying this goggle, which is the HD2, which is a 50 degree field of view LCD screen goggle. Um, and you know, I love this goggle. I love the field of view and this goggle is going to be my new goggle. The HDO twos are exactly what I've been looking for. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a minute when we go into like a little bit of the history on this goggle in particular. But before we get into any of this, let's go ahead and talk about the specs of this goggle and what makes this goggle so special. So first of all, this is a 50 degree field of view OLED goggle. It's got inner pupillary adjustments, which isn't anything new, but the thing that is new is the focus adjustment for each individual eye. So the actual lens itself moves in and out now, uh, also side to side for inner pupillary adjustments, but in and out to make individual eye adjustments for focus, which is something really, really cool. I didn't even really know that I needed it until I was able to use it. And now I can't go back. Uh, and I'll talk to you about that in a little bit when I actually compared these goggles back to back in person um, and you know found that that was a feature that was really much needed. Um, the other thing is the fact that there is a power button now, which you've probably heard of. There's probably been some rumor online of, oh, the new fact shorts have a power button. It's kind of a laughable thing because that's not really a, a perk or a spec that you can really have because it's a power button. It should just have one to begin with right well it's taken almost six years now for us to get a power button and uh yeah we got one but it doesn't necessarily work exactly the way that you think it should and i'll talk about that later in the video so again let's go ahead and dive in and i'll kind of compare my old goggles to these goggles and then we'll uh yeah you'll see why i'm going to be switching to this goggle all right guys, so here are the two goggles. On your left, you actually have the new HDO2s, and on your right, you'll have my old HD2s, which are, again, a 50 degree field of view LCD screen. And this is a goggle that came out about three or four years ago from Fat Shark, and there have been many iterations since then. There were the HD3s and then the HDOs, which were an OLED screen, but it had a much smaller field of view, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on why field of view is so important to me in particular, um, and why I've stuck with this goggle for so long. But as we're just comparing Comparing the two goggles to each other, they are in the exact same case. So if you were concerned about, you know, using the old receivers that you've been using, um, or you know, maybe the case as far as the the size of the case adjusting is definitely the exact same size case. There are some slight adjustments as you'll see when we flip these upside down because the cases are not interchangeable because of some of the new inner pupillary and, and the focus adjustments. So as of uh, as far as size is concerned, they are exactly the same. They do have the exact same top layout. So you still have the head tracking button. You have your analog recording, which is the start and stop for DVR and also puts you into the menu for DVR if you want to get into that to adjust, you know, if the DVR turns on when you start it or if you want to go and look back in your DVR. You have the volume button for your audio out. You have a channel button to change channels on your actual receiver if you want to do it that way, but most people do it through the receiver itself on the little front button. You also have a control display, which controls uh, side to side. It controls contrast and brightness, I think, is up and down. The one cool new feature about these goggles that wasn't in any other Fat Shark previous to this is the fact that there is a little OSD inside there now that tells you what increment you're at when you're changing um, contrast and brightness, which is really cool. You have a 1 through 20 increments on both up and down, and uh, you know when you click to the right, say you run 10, it'll go to 11, and you can actually tell where you are versus where the old goggles you were just kind of you know basing it off of. Oh, oh well, that well, it looks like that. Oh, it's not changing anymore. I must be bottomed out or maxed out or something like that. So those are kind of the differences as far as. There's not really anything physically different, but there is an OSD on the newer goggle. Now, the one thing that is different is the fact that the faceplate is a little bit smaller on this newer goggle, and I'll kind of show you that when I turn them around and you can see the optics. But the other thing is the fact that you don't have this anymore. So you do still have a fan, but you don't have this little 2S port. So there's this 2S plug that you usually have on your Fat Shark goggles um, batteries because typically they are 2S. However, this new goggle is good with 3S, so it is rated for 2S and 3S. And if you have a 3S battery, apparently the fan speed adjusts three levels where when you're on 2S it only adjusts two. Um, but typically on the older goggles on these face plates, you had the 2S port and I always broke the wires right here trying to plug them in out because this thing always grabbed the wire and the connector really well and when you tried to pull it out it would always break the wire so that's not really an issue anymore. You just plug in the barrel connector and it powers the fan internally and you don't have to worry about plugging in an extra plug on the outside of the goggle. Um, so that's kind of cool. Now. Let me flip these goggles over and I'll kind of show you the difference between the optics because there are some pretty big differences. 
and uh, how am I going to do this? Ooh. Okay, so we flip the goggles upside down, and you can now see the optics. So the differences between these optics are mainly to do with the fact that they're circular rather than rectangular like the older goggles. Now the older goggles uh, as you can see they do have this inner pupillary adjustment and it was I think the minimum was 59 degrees and it went all the way out to like 60 something degrees so that was you know obviously adjusting the individual lenses from side to side. Inner pupillary distance is obviously if you don't know the difference is one center of a pupil to the other center of a pupil and the distance that that has between them if you can adjust it correctly you can get both screens in focus and that was sometimes a problem depending on if you have a like narrower face or you have a really wide face sometimes you couldn't get fat sharks in focus and some of the screen would be out of focus and I'll talk about that a little bit more later because that was a problem that I didn't even really know that I had um, but yeah so anyways 50 degree field of view and these are rectangular and these are LCD and also, if you notice, the face plates are slightly different, um, and I'll show you more when we get in here. But the face plate foam is a little thicker, and also how these channels are put up. Uh, when you pop these up on your head, they've gone through a pretty good length of prototypes and different versions to get it to where it doesn't dig into your forehead, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later when we get over here. Um, but yeah, these are pretty good as far as not digging into your forehead. Um, but again, this is a little bit more complex over here. So when I talk about these, there are some things to consider. Also on the bottom, again, nothing really has changed um, as far as the bottom uh, on these, except there are a couple things. You still have the HDMI in both. You still have the audio out in both. You still have the ability to turn the receivers on and off. You have interpupillary adjustments. However, you don't have this AV out port right here, which was uh, designed for like head tracking, I think. I don't even remember what this port is used for. I've, actually never never used that port. So anyways, they replaced it with a power button over here. So let's just go ahead and move over to the HDO2s and uh, we'll you know talk about the differences between these two. God, what is, what is happening? Stay there. No, stop. Okay, there we go. So we go over here and you look at the HDO2s and the fact that the, go the optics are circular. So these do move in and out. Obviously you can see the inner pupillary adjustments are moving in and out. But then you can probably notice that if I move these focus adjustments, which are here on the bottom, the actual lens itself moves in and out, which is very useful for focusing each individual eye. You probably didn't know, but you your eyes are not exactly symmetrical, and one of them probably focuses a little bit differently than the other one. And it's super beneficial to be able to focus each eye independently. Not only can you move you know, obviously like the old ones, the inner pupillary distances, but now you can focus each eye independently. The best way that I found to focus each eye independently is just turn on some static and then focus one eye by closing the other eye, focus on the static and then obviously close the other eye and then focus that one on the static. That seems to be the best way that I found and then you can turn on an image and it's amazing looking. So these optics are super amazing and as you can tell, the, uh, the circular aspect of them, it actually gives you kind of like a Bond film like look if you if you were to turn them on and then compare to the old ones, you're not used to the circular. It's, uh, it's kind of different. Like you, it does look like you're looking down a gun barrel. So, you know, when you turn that on, you'll probably notice the screen is actually square, like four by three in the back of the goggle, but the actual optic part itself is a, cir a circular or a cylindrical um, item. So when you look through it, it kind of looks like you're looking down a gun barrel. I don't know. It's kind of a cool feature, but it's definitely something different that you'll notice about these goggles that are not in any of the other fat sharks. Now, also, the fact that they have these little foam pads here, um, and the faceplate is actually a little, a bit physically smaller. Um, and you'll notice that the foam on the nose piece is a little bit more protective here, and the f actual nose piece is a little bit more broad and wider. And uh, obviously, the foam on each of these goggles is not technically interchangeable because of the foam on this foam, this face pad being a little bit smaller, and then the nose piece being a little broader. Believe me, I've tried to swap back and forth, and I'll talk to you about a little bit of gripe I have later um, on how the optics fit my face. Um, and how close my eyeballs are and how I might want this to be a little bit thicker, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. You'll probably also know, oh, well, I guess the one last thing, this doesn't necessarily dig into your forehead. So you can pop these up on your head and it's pretty comfortable, but you know, some people might find it that I have to pop, I physically have to personally have to pop them a little bit higher up on my head to make it comfortable, but you, you know, you can and it works. So the next thing would be on the bottom that you've probably seen a lot of people talk about is this power button. Now I said in the beginning of this video that the power button doesn't necessarily work the way that you think it should. Now how the power button works is when you plug in this USB port or 
sorry, this uh, barrel connector here on the side, it actually turns the goggles on just like any old fat shark, right? But you hear the fan. So the fan is on, right? Well, if you click this power button, the fan actually changes speed. So in default, it's on whatever it was last set to. So typically it will be on low and there's no off feature for the fan. So the fan is always on using battery. Now it's on the lowest setting right now. If you click the battery thing once, it'll beep and then put it up to the higher setting with the fan. I think if you have a 3S battery, the fan setting does go a little bit higher, but I haven't tried it because I don't have any 3S batteries. But the fact is, is like nothing you would think that, that if that's the fan speed, well, let me hold this button down to turn the goggles off. Well, no, it's just gonna beep at you. Well, why is it doing that? <laughs> because it's in quote unquote legacy mode. So let me tell you what that is and what exactly we're talking about here. So if you pop this front cover off and you look inside here, you'll notice that this is slightly different. This red and black wire is, you know, go into the fan so you don't have to have that uh, connector out here anymore. And then uh, you'll see a USB port, which that's new. You'll see this little port right here, which is actually for your audio out and video out if you wanted to go to a ground station, which not a lot of people are using these days. They're all using internal receivers because pretty much the internal receiver is so good that it's not really justifiable anymore unless you're trying to go to the moon to run a ground station anymore. And then you'll notice right here, there's something that looks like a jumper. It's a little three pin jumper and you can jump two pins or two pins. Now, if you jump the two internal pins, the ones closest to the center of the goggle, then that's gonna be in quote unquote legacy mode. And what legacy mode is, is the fact that this button right here just changes your fan speed. It doesn't turn the goggle on and off, which I think is kind of lame and you know, whatever, but hey, it's there and that's what how they designed it. Um, now, if you click the pins over to the outside too, then it turns into whatever the new power mode where when you click this button, hey, that button's gonna turn the goggles on and off. I will talk about this in a little bit because I don't think it's necessarily ideal, but uh, hey, let's just go ahead and uh, talk about that now. These are gonna be my final thoughts on the HDO2s and uh, we'll compare them with the HD2s, which is the goggle that I've been flying for the last four years. And I'll talk about the LCD screen versus OLED screen and why one might be better than the other. And I'll also talk about the gripes I have with the new goggle because obviously nothing is perfect and there's gonna be some little things like especially the power button that I talked about, how it doesn't work the way that I think it should. And then also some other odd weird things about how thick this foam is and why um, I might want a thicker foam on there. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in a second, but first of all, I just wanted to kind of give you a brief background. So I've been flying the HD2s for the last three to four years now. Um, and when the HDOs came out, I really, like I got them early and I was kind of like, wow, this is a really good goggle. I love the OLED screen, but I can't justify going to the smaller field of view. And the way that I equate this is, is like having a smaller field of view um, than 50 degrees, which 50 degrees is kind of like that sweet buttery spot. It's essentially like sitting in the perfect spot in a movie theater where you can see everything, but you're not too close or you're having to look around and break your neck to see what's going on. Um, having a smaller field of view is like sitting in the back of the movie theater. So you can technically see everything that's going on, but you might be missing some details just because you're a little bit too far back. And you may be distracted by some female that's sitting there, or male, I don't know who you are, but hey, whatever. You might be distracted sitting in the back of the movie theater. So again, smaller field of view, like the OLEDs and the HDOs, was like sitting in the back of the movie theater for me. And the 50 degree field of view was very much like sitting in that sweet spot, sitting right in the middle. Um, and then to give you a, like a contrast, not literally, but a contrast to the sitting in the back of the movie theater, but would be like getting a pair of uh, like box goggles or something where you have so much field of view that your like eyes are fatigued because you're trying to look around and see what's going on. So that would be like sitting in the front of a movie theater being like, oh, 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 and you might miss something because <laughs> something happened over here when you were looking there. So again, 50 degrees was like the sweet spot. So when the OLED goggle came out, the HD01, um, I messaged Greg at Fat Shark and I was like, hey, um, I really love the OLED screen, but I can't justify going to a smaller field of view. I have nothing in like the boat with Fat Shark, so they're not you know paying me or doing anything. I just like their product. I've been using Fat Shark since day one. Regardless, I bought four sets at five hundred dollars a pop. Yes, I do get goggles for free these days, but it's not necessarily specific to me. Like they just send goggles out for promotional purposes, and I'm sure they get a lot more sales out of me making a video than I'm you know making in return by talking about the goggles. But they are something that I like and I use and I you know think is the best product available on the market as far as this particular product is concerned so again like 
I have a good relationship with Fat Shark and Greg, especially the guy that owns Fat Shark, and we have a pretty jovial relationship. And I was like, hey, HDOs came out. I don't like the field of view. Can you make a 50 degree? And he was like, well, you know, 50 degrees is pretty, uh, it's pretty expensive. Like it's probably going to be about 800 bucks to make a 50 degree field of view OLED goggle right now. And this was about two years ago when the OLED goggle came out, the HDO one. Um, basically, and he's like, you know, it's going to be expensive, but uh, I'll look into it. And then a couple months goes by, a couple months goes by, I send him another email. Hey, what's going on with that goggle? Are you going to make it? A couple months goes by, sends me an email. Hey, we might do something a couple months. And then eventually I got an email about the beginning of this year. And he's like, Hey, we're going to move forward with a 50 degree field of view OLED goggle um, project. I'll keep you updated as to what happens as we go along. Didn't hear anything for a long time. Kept poking him like, Hey, what's going on with these? They sent me a couple emails about the bite frost system. They sent me the bite frost system. And then randomly he's like, Hey, I, you know, I've been working on the 50 degree field of view OLED goggle. I'd like to send you a pair. Um, I got them on Monday or well, Friday, I guess of last week. And, um, you know, took them out and flew them on Monday and checked them out. And they're supposed to come out on Wednesday, which supposedly will be today. Um, so I haven't had them long, but it's pretty much exactly what I asked for. And there are a couple things like the power button and, you know, adjustable focus that I didn't necessarily ask for, but I kind of like the idea of the fact that I maybe pushed to have a 50 degree field of view OLED goggle and, and now it's here. So I just wanted to give you that background. I thought it was kind of a cool story. Um, but so let's just go ahead and talk about the gripes now, because obviously I wanted a 50 degree field of view OLED goggle and that's what I got, but uh, nothing's ever perfect. So what isn't perfect about this goggle? Now, the first thing I talked about was the power button and how I didn't do what I thought it should do. Now, right now, like I said earlier, you push the button and it turns the goggles on and off if you have it in one mode and then it changes the fan speed if you have it in another mode. Well. I think it's inconveniently placed. So when you put it on your head, you know, you grab your goggles and you're immediately going to click that button. It's a pretty easy button to press. And I just don't think it's a very suitable thing to have a single click do anything just because you're going to click it on accident a lot. So with that being said, there is a USB port here and I have talked to Fat Shark and they specifically said that they can't do anything directly for the production run that they're working on right now because these things are being mass produced and you can't put a beta firmware on something that you're going to be sending out to a mass, you know, population because it, usually will have a bug and it will be something that was completely unintended like maybe the one optic doesn't work or something like that so they're not going to do that right now but it is something that they intend on working on to come out with a firmware that will adjust what this power button does and how it works so i what i suggested to them was quick button two presses um, turns on the fan and turns it on different settings so each quick two press would change fan settings and then a long press maybe two to three seconds would turn the goggles on and off that seems a lot more feasible and a lot more realistic of how it should work um, that's just kind of an intuitive way that i thought it worked but it definitely doesn't work that way if you long press it right now it'll just beep at you indefinitely telling you that it's in legacy mode which i think is kind of dumb but hey you know that's what it does and i can't you know i can't criticize everything but i can criticize a lot of things but uh, so anyways, that is how it goes right now. Power button doesn't work the way I think it should, but I think it can be fixed with an easy update. The next thing would be the actual foam itself, not the foam, the foam. The foam that comes on here is very thin um, and it's actually not like the old foam. It's the same kind of material like this fake leather, but it has a couple of weird little spacers and it's not the same size. I think the old faceplate is a little bit bigger because if you try to put the old foam on the new goggle, there's a little bit of extra room, like maybe 10 millimeters of like build up because the the faceplate's a little bit smaller. Um, but with that being said, this foam is so thin. Yes, it gets your eyes really close to the optics, which is ideally what you want. But since the optics move in and out independently now, for me, when I'm focused, the optics are almost all the way out. So basically my eyelashes touch the lenses. And when my eyelashes touch the lenses, they get lenses, they get dirty and I have to clean them. When I clean them, it pushes them back to zero. So I have to refocus every time I clean the lens, which is kind of a pain in the butt. And I found that if I put this old foam on here, which ideally doesn't work because the foam around the nose doesn't actually protect you like this does. So you have like Velcro touching your nose and it ended up raw, like rubbing my nose raw, but it, you know, I tried it and it worked, but having a thicker foam there, these optics are very much forgiving as far as how far you can have your face away. Where some of the older goggles, you had to have your goggles on exactly a certain way and you had to have your face specifically spaced out a certain way with a certain type of foam to get everything in focus. But um, yeah, that's not really a, that big of a deal with the individual focusing on these newer goggles. Um, like, I don't know if I said this earlier, but when I went out and flew these two goggles back to back, that's what I did. I flew my old goggles first, and then I flew these goggles, and then I was like, hey, I don't really like these goggles for whatever reason, and I want to try my old goggles again. Well, when I went back to my old goggles, I kind of realized that 
I couldn't really get these in focus the way that I thought I could. Um, and I, you know, compared the two and I'm able to get both eyes independently completely in focus and see the entire 4x3 screen with no blurry edges, which is really crazy, especially considering it is 50 degree field of view. It's kind of overwhelming if you haven't seen 50 degrees field of view and it's all in focus. Um, and I went back to these guys and I was trying to focus them and I realized that for the last like four years, I've literally been flying with the half of my left eye completely out of focus and about a third of my right eye on the insides of both completely out of focus because the inner pupillary adjustments won't go close enough so on these goggles it's not necessarily that the inner pupillary adjustments go closer because these i think but uh, stop out at about 50 50 degree or 50 millimeters from center from i uh, basically inner pupil areas from center of one pupil to the center of the other pupil and mine's about 57 these go to 59 so that's kind of why i wasn't able to squeeze them in enough to get everything in focus but it seemed to be good for me and i guess i've been flying with a handicap for the last three years um but with these guys, it seems to be that the optics are actually more suited to not having to be specific um, as where like each eye independently focuses and also maybe the inner pupillary distance moves in a little bit closer. I'm not 100% sure on that one, but I think it does go to 57 millimeters. Um, and it's just a little more forgiving as far as where your eyeballs are. And that's why they went to some of the smaller field of views in their later goggles, like after this when they went to the HD3 and then the HDO, that's why they went. Obviously, HDO was kind of a cost thing, but the HD3, they went to a smaller field of view so that you could get more people to have more of the screen and focus just based on a generic of eyes that are all different. So you need it to be more acceptable for a wide variety of people. Okay, so with all of that being said, the reason that I switched between the two goggles and why I was like, wow, this goggle is really good, and then, wow, this one is really good, but I think I like my old goggles and I like them, and then I went back to these because I realized nothing could get in focus like these now. Um, I also noticed some kind of weird perceivable latency difference between the OLED and the LCD. So the difference between an OLED and an LCD screen is an OLED is an LED that turns on and off. And basically what that means is the blacks are much more black. So when you have an LED that's off, it's a black part. It's like a black dot on the screen, um, where when you have an LCD screen that's off, it's essentially a backlit system. So when it goes black, it's just gray. So it's never really black. So when you compare an OLED with an LCD, the gray in the LCD is like really as black as it can get. It's like kind of a black gray. And then when you talk about black on here, it's physically like you've turned something off in a cave and it's just pitch black. So the blacks are a lot better. Now, the difference between the two, and I don't know if this is a physical thing that you can measure, but it seems to be that the latency it's kind of like CMOS and CCD. Like, I don't think there's a latency difference, but I can tell you that I prefer one over the other, and I prefer the OLED over the LCD. So I've been flying with a handicap by being out of focus, and also I've been flying by a handicap because I've been flying this thing, which is like CCD or CMOS. I don't know, basically. If you know what I'm talking about with CMOS and CCD, you know that I like to fly a CCD camera, which is the old school version, just because of the way it reacts. And a CMOS camera is technically a better camera. And there are tests where people say, oh, this CMOS camera has the same latency as this CCD camera. So technically they're imperceivably different. Well, I can tell you that I prefer a CMOS regardless, or sorry, a CCD, regardless if the CMOS is as good. Um, same thing goes with these. Like probably there isn't a difference that you can measurably see, but I can tell you that I prefer the OLED and how it reacts to light better than I prefer the LCD. And I also prefer the CCD over the CMOS. And kind of touching on that subject, subject, if you notice CMOS is a very washed out camera and a CCD is a very contrasty camera. Well, this is exactly the same thing. An OLED screen is a very contrasty screen and an LCD screen is a very washed out screen. So if you pair those two together and you don't oppose them, then you get a very broad spectrum of contrast basically. So if you contrast um, compare the difference between a CMOS camera on an LCD screen, which has a very good balance, um, a balanced contrast level versus a CMOS camera on an OLED screen, which has a very contrast good balance. Well, if you take a washed out CMOS camera and a washed out LCD screen and place them together, then it's a very washed out image. If you take a very contrasty CCD camera and put it with an OLED screen, then it's a very contrasty image. And that's technically what I'm flying right now. So it's a very contrasty image. And I think a CMOS camera pairs better with an OLED screen and a CCD camera pairs better with an LCD screen. 
but eventually CMOS will take over and CCD will cease to exist, but as of right now, I still prefer the way that CCD cameras react to the light and how they adjust according to image and how it, the timing is, basically. Same thing with the OLED screen. Like, yes, I'm gonna be flying in an extra contrasty environment because I'm flying with a CCD camera and I'm flying with an OLED screen, and I might be flying in a very contrasty environment, say like noon, where there's a lot of bright light, open clear sky, and there's a lot of trees that have dark shadows. That's gonna be a pretty harsh environment to fly with an OLED screen and a CCD camera. But there's obviously never a perfect scenario, and there's always gonna be the worst scenario, and that seems to be what I've found to be the worst scenario, is a very bright day with an OLED screen and a CCD camera. But again, I don't typically fly in that kind of environment, so it's not something that I'm gonna see on a regular basis and it was definitely flyable it was just something that i noticed was extremely contrasty um, but it was hard to see anyways even with an lcd lcd screen so hopefully you in, uh, enjoyed me talking about this stuff and i hope you learned some little nuggets of information about oled and uh, ccd and cmos and i till still to this day prefer cmos camera or sorry ccd cameras the old school one and uh, i do really really like the oled screens in these guys so Again, hopefully you learned something, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you for joining me. Have a good, uh, have a good day.